Welcome back to Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. It's me, Tony B, hosting our special impacts of the coronavirus on South Seattle and surrounding communities broadcast that we do every Friday from one to three. We started this on March 13th, and I'll be honest with you, I, I didn't know we'd be continuing to do it this long, but every week we've had impactful guests on our show uh, from our community. We actually uh, had a COVID-19 positive guest on our radio station when they weren't even telling us that it was impacting South Seattle. Um, we've connected with other communities because uh, everyone um, is susceptible to getting this virus. What we found out in this process and what everyone else found out was that this was, of course, going to, I say of course because there are folks who, uh, who knew this already, in particular if you were part of the black community or marginalized communities or brown communities, that this was going to be exacerbated in communities of color. And lo and behold, of course, uh, it is. Our outreach extended to Bremerton and Edmonds and Everett and Yakima and Spokane uh, because folks were looking for answers and sharing uh, solutions, sharing trials and tribulations, sharing challenges and sharing what their communities were done and learning from communities. And of course, our uh, byproduct of this was our uh, listenership, viewership picked up exponentially and we began to broaden the scope of what we do. And so I'm happy uh, to have a member of the Kent Black Action Coalition, Mr. Richard Johnson, joining us now. Mr. Johnson, are you there? Yes, I am. How are you doing, Tony B? Under the circumstances, fantastic. Richard Johnson is currently retired after 34 years at the Xerox, Xerox Corporation and six years of military service uh, in the United States Army. Uh, Richard also served on the Board of Trustees for the Veterans Cemetery at Evergreen, Washelli in Seattle, uh, and currently is the Marketing Media Relations Director at Kent Black Action Commission, a community-based nonprofit organization based in Kent, Washington, and, and I might add, uh, uh, a black belt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, as well. Mr. Johnson, uh, thank you for joining us on the program. Uh, let's get this started. Uh, if you can, and this is a big question, we'll get into more specifics, but let's start by talking about the impact of the coronavirus uh, on the community of Kent, because people may not know specifically uh, how this uh, impacted the community and the community members of Kent. Well, obviously, just like everyone else, uh, we're, we weren't immune from any of the varied impacts. And emotionally, and uh, not knowing in the beginning, our emotions were rocked right away when we found out that uh, King County had purchased a vacant hotel here in Kent and decided to use that as a holding facility for those people who they suspected might be exposed to the virus, et cetera and uh, couldn't social distance in any other environment. So they're gonna bring them here to Kent. And the angst rose with that because uh, uh, I think when everybody found out about it, it was already happening. And at that time it was early on. So nobody knew what that meant. So there was a lot of anxiety surrounding that. And, and then to add to that, one of the first residents of that facility uh, just upped and walked away one day. <laughs> and, and luckily, the test results from that individual turned out to be negative once they had left. But that started off our emotional roller coaster with the, with the pandemic. And uh, then as we, we uh, in the early stages, of course, it, we, everything was immediately shut down. And uh, the economic impact, we don't even know the whole story yet. You know, what the totality of the economic impact we know we had a lot of people that were locked out of work because of the, the shutdown. Uh, we know that some of those people are not able to go back to their jobs. Um, and, and Kent is a bedroom community 
So when you talk about it impacting Boeing, that impacted a lot of our residents uh, and some of the, the major companies. Um, we do have uh, Blue Origins here in Kent and we have Amazon as a warehousing um, uh, magnet here in Kent, but most of our residents are working in Seattle and, and, and Bellevue and that type of thing. So all of a sudden we were without uh, places to go to work and stuff to do. And then immediately we had a problem with people getting food because uh, revenue wasn't coming in, income was cut short. So one of the, the persisting predicaments that we're trying to face right now is uh, uh, getting food to people. Um, KBAC um, was able to partner with um, um, one of our other local community-based organizations, Glover Empower Mentoring. Uh, they had set up a program with uh, one of our local Black-owned restaurants, um, Alta's uh, Cajun Spices and Deli. And uh, through that partnership, we were able to get close to 2,000 free meals to the children that were displaced from having uh, the meal support that they would get when they go to school. Can you share with uh, our listeners who may be unfamiliar with Kent, uh, what Kent is as a city, as a community, uh, what it looks like, who lives there, uh, what the commerce is, that you, you kind of shared that a little bit, but if you wouldn't mind expanding and, and giving us a theater of the mind uh, version uh, of who Kent is and what Kent is, Kent is for folks who may be unfamiliar. Uh, Kent is uh, the sixth largest city in the state of Washington. Uh, we're centrally located uh, with freeway access to, to Tacoma, Seattle, uh, Bellevue. Um, population is around 130, 132,000. Um, we are we, we are told that we're the 10th most diverse city in the United States. So, uh, so we're, uh, and Kent is doing a fast transition. Um, we're the, the, the mix of, of quote unquote minorities is growing pretty fast in Kent. Uh, so we, we've got growing pains along those lines adjusting to that. And that was, uh, probably one of the reasons that Kent Black Action Commission was formed uh, as a fallout of some of those adjustment pains we were having because the city was uh, becoming uh, more uh, more brown and black. And that segues uh, wonderfully into my next question, which is tell us about the Kent Black Action Committee, uh, when, why they were formed, um, what y'all do, uh, and uh, that's a couple of questions. I don't want to throw too many of you at once, but then I'm also going to be asking you, uh, as a coalition, uh, what your response was uh, to the COVID-19 pandemic. But let's start off by first, uh, Kent Black Action Coalition. Who are you? Um, what do you do? Yeah, and we're actually the Kent Black Action Commission. Commission. Thank you. My apologies. Yeah. Uh, well, in its found, I'm, I came into uh, KBAC, as uh, we call ourselves. I came into KBAC uh, a year after it was formed. And KBAC was formed as an a indirect result of what was happening in Kent at the time. Uh, that was around two, 2010, 2011 timeframe. And at that time, there was a, 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 a several incidents of... Um, of our black children being handcuffed in school. Uh, uh, the, the resident resource officers from the police department were being called in to deal with behavioral issues in the schools, junior high, high school. And they were actually handcuffing the kids, uh, not arresting them, but handcuffing them and restraining them. And uh, the backlash in the black community was immediate. Uh, and people started getting together to strategize uh, what they were going to do. And, and in, the, in the middle of that, in someone's garage, the idea came up to form uh, Kent Black Action Commission. And the, the first task was to address the, the use of police in the, in the schools. Um, and, and from there, uh, we um, 
we started to form as a as a nonprofit organization. We we did uh, um, incorporate as a nonprofit five hundred one three C and and started to uh, build our mission statement. And uh, our our mission was roughly that uh, we wanted to improve. Uh, well, our vision was to have Kent become a example to the world and uh, uh, South King County, an example of working together in an integrated and harmonious atmosphere and that people would look to us for guidance moving into the future. Uh, our, our mission was to um, create a black presence in Kent so that we were known and we were here so we wanted to create um, strategic relationships throughout the city here in Kent, uh, which means we wanted to, the mayor to know who we were. We wanted to open up a communications link uh, with the mayor, the police chief, and the city council, and any other key providers from the city standpoint. And so we set out to do that. Uh, as a result, we, we, we came up with our, um, work plan that included uh, uh, as much as we can to be at city council's meetings and and just be present and let people know that there was uh, a black presence and, and that there was a, a, a black organization that would stand up for the black community. You're listening to Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. It's me, Tony B, uh, hosting our weekly uh, show. The impacts of the coronavirus pandemic on South Seattle and surrounding communities. My guest joining me uh, is Mr. Richard Johnson. Richard is currently the Marketing and Media Relations Director at the Kent Black Action Commission, a community nonprofit organization that is based in Kent, Washington. And Mr. Johnson, as I'm listening to this uh, and hearing that the reason why you came in to be at 2010 and 2011 let me make sure I heard this correctly, was students and the treatment of students who were being handcuffed by police officers. Did I hear that correctly? Uh, yes, sir, you absolutely did. <laughs> and uh, we've had several actions uh, to tamp that down. Needless to say, that no longer happens in Kent schools. Wow, I, I, I think you can imagine that I'm thinking that the times that we're in now were for a lot of people, uh, what they're seeing happening um, with George Floyd. And, and this has been happening and been happening and been happening, but it has come to a point where it has again drawn uh, national and international attention. But to think that um, that was the birth of the Kent Black Action Commission was to address and I'm calling it police brutality, you can call it something else, but uh, the treatment of, of students in Kent schools and black schools in schools being handcuffed. Wow. Yeah, and, and for me personally, what's going on now with uh, Brother George Floyd and Almond Arbery, Breonna Taylor, just to, to me, what I don't want to go by the wayside, I, the narrative is being hijacked and talking about rioting and looting. But this, the, the real narrative is the same thing that Colin Kaepernick kneeled for, is injustice driven by racial animus that's driven by a history of racism. And I don't want that message to get lost. Uh, and to me, it, it's, it opens up old scars. I, uh, I'm, I'm originally from Columbus, Ohio, and I experienced my first bouts with racism while I was a child in Ohio, first, first hand. And, and at that time, we got to the point where all we knew what to do was to actually physically fight in the streets. And then, then I, I, I moved to uh, Los Angeles area, Compton first, and then Los Angeles, and I lived in Los Angeles at the time of the Watts riots. Matter of fact, it was only 
the, the flashpoint was only blocks away from my house. And I could tell you that this practice of stopping you for being black was happening frequently all the time. It happened to me several times. Uh, I was called the N-word just for being out on my own front porch and told to get in the house by the LAPD. Uh, I saw them beat people up. I saw them come in to ride around the neighborhood just for the simple fact they wanted to try to intimidate us. And, and uh, I'm not saying all of them participated because I have run across some good policing, but this policing is out of control. It's nothing new. And we should not let this message get clouded by the fact that it's about racism and it's about policing from a, a group or an entity that has a, a legacy of policing from the days of slave catching. Uh, Mr. Johnson, when we originally uh, scheduled you to be here, we were talking about COVID-19 and shortly after that, these things unfolded. And so as we lean into this conversation uh, and we see things unfolding and uh, again, now there, there appears to be some longevity to the protests that continue to happen. I was leaving, uh, I was at a demonstration earlier today by students at Franklin High School. Uh, there'll be another one. Uh, at K through five less shy um, in Seattle uh, for the Kent Black Action Coalition, uh, have have you been engaged or involved um, in uh, in any of the actions in regards to setting up protests or march? Or can you share with us uh, what the climate has been in Kent in Seattle? Folks have been protesting air and night. Right. Yeah, uh, we will have a Black Lives Matter. Uh, um, march and demonstration coming up next week on uh, June 11th. And this was not, this is a grassroots effort from our young people here in Kent. They see this stuff. Uh, they don't like what they see on TV. They definitely are, are uh, appalled at what they saw when it comes to uh, George Floyd. And, and they came to the the older people and said, what can we do? And this is what we want to do. Can you support us in it? And we absolutely are. So we'll have a, a, an action uh, with hopefully there's going to be a very broad coalition across the city of Kent. And, and, and we really mean action. As a matter of fact, we're, we're going to take this time to continue our efforts to register voters and encourage voting and, and do uh, voter education to make sure that we mirror what happened when uh, President Barack Obama first ran uh, with the turnout, because and we absolutely have a challenge of getting all our people engaged in voting. You're listening to Rainier Avenue Radio dot world. It's me, Tony B. This is our regular Friday broadcast uh, of the impact of the coronavirus pandemic on South Seattle and surrounding communities. My guest is Richard Johnson, media director for the Kent Black Action Commission. Um, and uh, Mr. Johnson, uh, again, as we said earlier, we, we knew that this was going to be something that impacted communities uh, of color. Uh, and now you add on to it the awareness, again, not that it wasn't already happening, but the awareness of racial disparities uh, and police brutality against people of color, in particular, black people. Can you share with us uh, the current uh, racial climate in Kent? Um, we don't know, it, it might be fine, there, there might be uh, some things, but as a member of the Kent Black Action Commission, how would you describe even, even the relationship now between the citizens and the police department? Has there been communication? Are people feeling safe? Are they feeling unsafe? Uh, just kind of open, honest, frank conversation about what that climate is right now for race in the city of Kent. Well, one thing that we've been doing for several years now, as part of our activism uh, and, and, and identifying the police chief and introducing ourselves to him, we, we started uh, 
this is probably the fourth year in a row the uh, diversity task force is what it was coined and this wednesday we just met with the police chief because uh we we have a high profile case right here in kent that's uh two years old but the family is suing for a wrongful death of a young black man uh giovanni mcdade and so the the uh the, the civil lawsuit from the, the parents was filed, I, I believe, just recently, maybe last week. And so that is bringing up the old ones because when that happened, we we had marches and protests here in Kent when when that went down. Uh, and Giovanni McDade was a young man that, that was shot by the police through his windshield. And the, the justification was that uh, there was a police chase they thought they had the car pinned in and supposedly the officer exited his vehicle and the driver accelerated to get away from the police and the police assumed he was attempting to ram him, so he shot him. Uh, and um, the family is not buying the story. The community is supporting the family. And that's one of the, the catalysts for our, our, our march along with what happened to George Floyd and and everything we've seen across the nation, we we're, we have a local incentive to try to uh, stop any excessive force use as possible. Uh, the the other thing that the the other thing that we were at odds with the police at that time when we first started was the use of the chokehold, and as a result of our interaction with the police, they went to some modified restraint that didn't include that traditional chokehold that we saw in New York. The gentleman supposedly was guilty of selling cigarettes and they choked him out. And uh, we also discussed the technique used in the, in the Floyd case. And we were assured by the Kent Police Department that that was, was out of their procedure. They did not use that procedure they use a, a shoulder procedure. And my comment when the chief was telling us that, and I said, with, with all due respect, chief, that had nothing to do with procedure. What we saw with Lloyd, it, it didn't look like a, a, an intentional murder. So, and he actually agreed with that. It was, and it was not a policy. And he said that if that would happen in Kent, that those, the officers would be fired and charged. And, and so th th wh how would you describe, uh, and thank you for sharing that, and I do remember that, and uh, again, it happens so often, it is unfortunate uh, that we can't keep every time this happens top of mind. Um, but the, the current, uh, with everything that's going on right now, how would you describe and share with our listeners uh, the, the, the racial climate in the city of Kent. Would you, again, would you call it, do people, and I know you can't speak for everyone in the city, but do people generally feel safe? Uh, is there an uneasiness? Um, what's going on? I, I think there's, uh, there's a modicum of safe feeling, but I think there's a challenge and, and it, it's always a challenge. And we're, we have a fear as, as the, older adults, we have a fear with our young people and their relationship with the police because I still, now, now let me back up and say, our group has, we've actually trained with the police. So we understand their training a little bit better. I personally went to the police academy and, and did uh, some, some training on, on blue courage, which was trying to bring policing back to a noble uh, position rather than uh, intimidate and control back to uh, uh, serving. Uh, and we also went through implicit bias training. And so we're working, but we have a fear with our young people being out there because we still feel that if, if you're black and young and you're doing something silly, you're more at risk than a young white kid doing the same silly thing. So, so it's tenuous. I think we're working hard to, to make it better, but we don't think we're there. We think we got some work to do. You're listening to Rainer Avenue Radio World special broadcast uh, every Friday 
uh, the impact of the coronavirus on South Seattle and surrounding communities. Uh, my guest is Mr. Richard Johnson, the media director for the Kent Black Action Commission. And uh, this is, of course, morphed into uh, some of the more nuanced uh, things of our society where disparities begin to show up. And if you are not aware of uh, what's been happening, uh, George Floyd was a black man that was killed uh, in Minneapolis by a white police officer who put his knee on his neck it was all filmed, and this took about nine minutes. That, of course, has resulted in protests locally, regionally, nationally, and all over the world. Uh, again, our, our initially what we were talking about was going to be COVID-19, but I want to give you opportunities for final words here, Mr. Johnson, just about all of this that you want to share with our communities. I, I think, uh, and I support the protests that are going on in various places uh, across the United States and even in other countries. Uh, and I don't think it should stop. I don't, I don't endorse any violence, I, I, I think, but we have the right to have our voice and certain we should continue to do that. The other impacts of the virus, it has forced us as an organization to try to em embrace technology a little bit more. Um, we're, um, trying to use technology, much like we're doing today with this interview, uh, we're incorporating technology in that because we had to cancel our Juneteenth cultural celebration that we have every year. Uh, we, we usually have the candidates that are running for office, we grill them in front of the public. So we're working now feverishly to figure out how we're gonna do that with technology. I think we have the answer. Now we just need to put all that in place. So. It's called, uh, the coronavirus has caused us to adapt to try to continue to have our presence felt here in Kent and South King County and to move forward with technology to reach more people. Well, Mr. Johnson, I will just uh, thank you for being here and also uh, let you know uh, that you have the services of Rainier Avenue Radio. We have the platform to virtually uh, reach people and connect with people. And so uh, as you are putting together uh, these things that you need to do to make sure that folks informed, folks in Kent are, are, are informed, um, know that you have uh, us as a resource for a platform. Well, I appreciate that, Tony, and I appreciate you giving me the, the time to interact with your audience. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Uh, again, this is uh, Rainier Avenue Radio Dot World and our special broadcast that we do every Friday of the impact of the coronavirus on South Seattle and surrounding communities. Again, my guest has been a Mr. Richard Johnson, media director for the Kent Black Action Commission. We will be back to wrap up the show right after this. Rainier Avenue Radio dot world breaking Make Music Day Seattle happens June 21st summer solstice every year Make Music Day Seattle is part of the worldwide Make Music Day celebration now, typically this features free music outdoor concerts performances music lessons jam sessions and musical events on streets sidewalks and parks <laughs> We can't do that this year. Make Music Day Seattle this year will be virtual. Like the entire worldwide celebration. Make Music Day Seattle and its virtual approach encourages all people, all music ability to celebrate the joy of making music. Rainier Avenue Radio will broadcast via live stream events held in Seattle communities and around the world. Over 85 cities. Make Music Day Seattle. Demonstrating the power of music to unite and uplift people. Highlights of Make Music Seattle. Tiny bands marching through your Tiny community. marching bands walking through the Seattle downtown waterfront. A vocalist walking and singing through downtown Seattle and Westlake Park. Bash the Trash. Bash the Trash offer innovative design, everyday refuge into musical instruments. Live from home. Make Music Alliance invites everyone to post a musical performance. From home. For more Music Day Seattle virtual highlights, check the website at RainierAvenueRadio.world. This is the news on Rainier Avenue Radio. A Long Island man and New York City pharmacist called the Mass Man was arrested in connection with the hoarding and price gouging of thousands of N95 masks during the coronavirus pandemic. 66-year-old Richard Sharipa of Fort Salonga, Pashtakam reports, violated the Defense Production Act, lied to law enforcement, engaged in health care fraud, and committed aggravated identity theft. Sharipa surrendered Tuesday and is scheduled to appear in a Manhattan federal court. So what exactly did he do? 
Between February and April 8th, Sharipa spent more than $200,000 on N95 masks. Then Sharipa charged up to $25 per mask that he purchased for $20 that generally cost $1.27. He defrauded Medicare and Medicaid and exploited the personal information of his pharmacy's customers to fill prescriptions. His customers spanned eight states and included funeral homes and doctors. Asians recovered 6,660 masks, roughly, from Sharipa. And that's your news on Rainier Avenue Radio. Class of 2020 graduates, we are... Well, no, wait a minute, let me see. To the esteemed graduates of the class of 2020. Run that, run, run that back again. When you finish high school, college, grad school, or, or even grade school, I mean, you're still graduating. It just doesn't, it just doesn't feel right. 2020 graduates, we got you. Rainier Avenue Radio celebrates your hard work while maintaining safe and social distance. Rainier Avenue Radio celebrates your Corona mincement without the crowds, Aww. but with a lot of pomp and circumstance. Rainier Avenue Radio, 2020 Corona Mincement shout out. If you'd like your grad to get a shout out on Rainier Avenue Radio, contact us at rainieravenueradio.world at gmail.com. That's rainieravenueradio.world at gmail.com. Shout out to all the 2020 graduates.